Censorship is a controversial subject, especially on social media. Although we here in the West claim to value freedom of speech and open discussion, many European countries have hate speech laws. Supposedly, the raison d'etre for hate speech laws is to protect marginalized groups from attacks on them and their dignity. In reality, this kind of censorship has been used by the establishment to target those views that challenge cosmopolitan liberalism. Even in countries with formal free speech protections, such as the United States, censorship by technological giants like Facebook and Twitter is common. This informal censorship aims at targeting misinformation that would interfere with the agendas of powerful people. Those that believe the wrong things about COVID or the 2020 election are not allowed to share these views on social media. That said, while most countries around the world have some amount of censorship, not every country has adopted Western-style speech codes. Some still hold to an older idea of regulating media in the name of protecting public morals rather than protecting a particular political agenda. These countries pay especially close attention to foreign media because it reflects customs and norms that are alien to the country importing it. To give some examples, Russia has banned certain anime that feature reincarnation as a major plot point. India is in the middle of placing stricter regulations on social media companies. And Nigeria responded to Twitter's censoring of its president by outright banning Twitter from the country. Since markets are now international, media corporations that try to make a profit overseas must cater to the censorship standards of these foreign countries. The only alternative is to not sell these products overseas at all. This can lead to some hilarious hypocrisy, such as Hollywood studios threatening to boycott the American state of Georgia in the name of social justice while selling their wares overseas to China without a thought even going so far as to cater to the racial prejudices of the Chinese consumers. Why do these companies do this? Why do they virtue signal to the tune of billions of dollars here in the West while catering to market demand and foreign censorship overseas? That is an interesting question, but not one that left-wingers have an answer for. Or at least, they don't have a good one. A good example of a leftist with no clue about what's going on is Hunter Avalone, a former Christian conservative anti-SJW YouTuber. I remember watching him back in 2016-2017 and remember quickly getting bored of him. He possessed neither the entertaining bravado of outrage peddlers like Paul Joseph Watson nor the intellectual substance found on channels like the Distributists. Hunter's commentary, if you could call it that, consisted of tired cliches about stupid SJWs repeated in the kind of smug, self-satisfied way that only someone who didn't know what he was talking about could affect. I hadn't been following Hunter's channel closely in recent years, but I had heard of his apostasy his spats with Nick Fuentes, and the clownish arguments he made that were refuted by YouTubers like Settler's Lament. I'll admit, I had certain expectations going into Hunter's video on Disney's gay problem, but what I was most struck by was the remarkable consistency between it and his old anti-SJW videos. Certainly, the talking points had changed from mainstream conservative to mainstream progressive, but how they were delivered and their lack of depth remained consistent. Hunter's video begins with his elaboration of Disney's gay problem, how it tries to pander to American activists on Twitter while kowtowing to moral censorship overseas. It does this by sneaking in subversive progressive messages under the radar, as it were. Hunter then criticizes three groups. The liberals, who praise Disney for handing them only breadcrumbs. The conservatives, who oppose Disney's virtue signaling for reasons that can only be bigotry. And Disney itself, 
for pleasing nobody in its efforts to please everybody. Finally, he argues that media representation is important to normalizing subversive behaviors like sodomy, and that while Disney's pandering is better than nothing, it isn't good enough. Disney needs to stop putting profits before people and start standing up for progressive values. The point of this video, it seems, was for Hunter to demand that Disney pander even more to left-wingers on Twitter. He talks about this as if it were common sense, and I suppose it is for him. As much as I disapprove of Hunter Avalon's views, I'll give him one thing. The video he made is not bad at what it tries to do. It highlights Disney's hypocrisy and the controversy that it causes, and outlines a case for media representation that is as good as any. By seeing more sodomites on television, people will get the impression that sodomy is normal, thereby normalizing it. The breadcrumbs Disney throws to left-wing activists to appear progressive while placating the non-progressive moral sensibilities overseas shows their cynicism. It seems like an open and shut case. However, there are problems with the narrative that media corporations are only passive reflections of public opinion. To see this, let's start by assuming that Disney is making cartoons like The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder, and Out, and hosting pride shows to cater to kids with hip views. Seeing all this, one has to ask, where did those kids get their hip views? Besides parents and peers, which would only push the question back, they'd mainly be getting their views from either public education or media companies like Disney. But wait, some progressives might say, Disney was just being cynical. Maybe, but a cynical actor can push for an agenda as effectively as a sincere one. For many years, advertising campaigns like the award-winning Think Before You Speak and sitcoms like Friends, Ellen, or The Office paved the way for the normalization of such beliefs in the wider culture. This was all part of a calculated political tactic aimed at turning liberal views on sexuality into conventional wisdom. Psychologist Dr. Marshall Kirk and ad man Hunter Madsen outlined this tactic in their book After the Ball, How America Will Conquer Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the 90s. The book is a manifesto that outlines the author's plan to normalize sodomy. As part of their proposed strategy, they suggested an extensive PR campaign to depict sodomites as normal, healthy individuals unjustly maligned by homophobes. They suggested that the propaganda campaign use shaming, social ostracization, and other tactics deliberately aimed at manipulating emotions rather than appealing to reason. Needless to say, the implementation of this has been widely successful. The media is not the only source of indoctrination. The education system is also rife with this nonsense. On the level of higher education, queer theory and sophistical arguments against conservative opponents abound. Younger children, meanwhile, have been subject to campaigns by NGOs and by the formal state itself to queer their education and promote so-called alternative lifestyles. However, mass media is the most useful tool in the arsenal of left-wing activists. While academia is the source of progressive ideas, it is media corporations that spread them throughout the Western world and beyond and inculcate these messages through narrative rather than argument. Hunter Avalon might push back by claiming that it was the science that caused people to change their minds on such issues. I mean, surely his mind was changed by such things, right? Still, even if Hunter cites a study or two that he claimed changed his mind, such mass media had to have had a greater impact than he might realize, for two reasons. First, for every study out there that supports the progressive narrative, there is another that complicates it, and these dissenting studies aren't hard to find. One can look at Ubersoy's video, The Homosexual Environment, for a comprehensive presentation of such studies. Given how many scientific papers are out there, 
you can always find some academic that confirms whatever moral views you happen to have, especially if you're a leftist. Second, unless the papers Hunter's been reading are in the field of ethics, they aren't going to give him a rigorous moral framework. At best, they can provide refutations of conservative talking points or policy ideas. But there's more to moral views than these things. It will be Disney and other Western media companies that will be filling in the blanks in Hunter's moral framework with platitudes like, be proud of who you are, or love is love. I do not doubt that Hunter Avalon's liberal views are, in large part, a product of such relentless propaganda. We can see in him the feedback loop this ideological indoctrination creates. Hunter and other political actors are influenced by liberal messaging. They then advocate for ratcheting up the kind of propaganda that indoctrinated them to begin with. Rinse and repeat until the ideology is ubiquitous. In this microcosm, we see that the push for equality, divorced from any higher goal, becomes a self-perpetuating loop of power-mongering, as I described in a previous video on the anti-SJWs. In short, Hunter is promoting the very same normalization process that caused him to become a progressive. I wouldn't go as far as to say he lacks self-awareness. After all, he, much like the rest of the progressive left, is aware of the power of mimetic desire. What Hunter does not realize is that, in conceding that Disney's tokenism is better than nothing, he is acknowledging the usefulness of cynical actors in influencing people. The sincerity of the actor is of no relevance to how influential they are. Hunter may lambast Disney for not being sincere enough in its activism, but it was more than likely Disney or some similarly cynical actor that convinced Hunter to adopt his current beliefs. This seems to be a running theme on the modern left. They seem incapable of recognizing that cynical actors can be the source of leftist ideology. They claim woke capitalism must be a mere reflection of market trends because corporations are cynical and cynical actors can never be the source of their ideas. They must emerge from the free spirit of the people. On its face, the idea that public opinion exists independent of capital is laughable, but it is inexcusable for a leftist to believe this. Some of the most influential leftists of all time, like Karl Marx, Antonio Gramsci, Max Horkheimer, and Michel Foucault, talked about the relationship between economic conditions and the wider culture. The modern left conveniently forgets this whenever their beliefs come under scrutiny, but the message is clear. Power does not conform to public opinion. Rather, it's public opinion that conforms to the powerful. I believe that this blind spot in the modern left's analysis of power and its effect on culture is a result of a fundamental contradiction in the left's view of human nature. The modern left often justifies its support of historically marginalized groups with an appeal to authenticity. In the left's view of history, past regimes forced cis-heteronormativity and white supremacist capitalist patriarchy onto the masses. These systems suppressed the people's self-expression, forcing them to be what they were never meant to be, and creating alienation even among individuals in the oppressor groups. The modern left seeks to dismantle these oppressive systems and reveal the people's true selves, even if they have to use authoritarian means to stamp out bigotry. However, if mimetic desire is real, then the authenticity the left is aiming at will not be the result of a pure self-expression by an autonomous individual. The assertion of uniqueness is going to be a product of the stereotypes and rituals found in the media. The stated purpose of these movements is to give historically marginalized groups the autonomy to express themselves, but mass media conglomerates like Disney will inevitably mold these expressions in their image. Again, I emphasize that this conclusion follows inevitably from Hunter's argument for media representation. If the most popular television shows all depict sodomy as being normal, healthy behavior, then the average viewer will get the impression that sodomy is normal, healthy behavior. 
This could not be the case if mimetic desire did not exist. Hunter's view that Disney is only out to pander to previously existing liberal views cannot be the whole story. Disney and companies like it are largely responsible for these views being so widely held in the first place. So, if Disney is just a cynical actor out to make money, why are they supporting sodomy? That's a whole separate topic that I'll cover another time. For now, I'll link below to Endeavor's take on the matter, which I think is very good. This contradictory anthropology is ubiquitous among the bread tube left. Vosh, Sean, everyone embraces it. Despite its ubiquity, the narrative is pretty silly. On its face, it's asking us to accept that, 10 to 15 years ago, the Western masses all spontaneously decided that gay marriage, trans rights, and white privilege were all urgent issues that needed addressing, and that corporations simply had no choice but to go along with this massive tide of popular support. And why did this change suddenly happen? Leftist magic, presumably. An understanding of mimetic desire and a little common sense shows that this narrative is entirely ad hoc, a way for the left to deal with the fact that it is not the underdog in this fight. As our media becomes more pornographic, the social norms of the people will change. People will become desensitized to sex and think nothing of showing off graphic sex acts in public, even to children. We already see this in effect among the left, who think nothing of showing pornographic content to children for educational purposes, or having their kinks on full display at a pride parade. Given the state of the West, is it any wonder that conservatives will go overboard in trying to prevent this kind of nonsense from infecting their communities? Are they bigots for doing so? Hunter Avalon seems to think so, but in this section I wish to push back on this by making a case for moral censorship. Before I begin, however, I need to preempt the objections sure to come out of the classical liberal camp. These people will try to defend the absolute right of freedom of speech against what I'm saying, but even they must concede that individual acts must be constrained by a moral standard. Freedom alone cannot distinguish between free acts we can take from free acts we cannot take. All reasonable individuals must appeal to some value outside of freedom to distinguish between what's acceptable and what isn't. Your liberty ends where morality begins. Understood like this, freedom can only exist insofar as the moral order of a society requires it to exist. Having understood this, the question then becomes, what is this moral order? Why do we need it? To understand the moral order, we need to understand what a community is, and how the moral order relates to a community. A community is a group of people united under a shared way of living. This way of life sets apart members of a community from outsiders. The community's members learn certain norms through practical education and embody them through their customs, standards, and laws. These norms demand continual development, and thus seem demanding to an outsider, yet they make life easier for members of the community. In my community, I know what is appropriate and what is offensive, what ought to be pursued and what ought to be avoided. With an outsider, however, there's a level of apprehension. I have no idea whether what I say or do will be considered a social faux pas. This is why outsiders who have not internalized the community's norms will inevitably introduce discord into the community and, if they are not handled carefully, will lead to that community's breakdown. The collection of a community's norms is what makes up its moral order. The community requires, and is defined by, the moral order it embodies. Humans have a natural tendency to use their neighbors as a model for themselves. Whatever their neighbors possess, they covet, and whatever their neighbors desire, they desire. This would naturally lead to a conflict were it not for the moral order. A moral order creates a model neighbor that the community members take as the model for their desires. This way, the common good of the community becomes the desires of the people. The moral order of a community can be thought of as its soul because it gives life to the community, unites the community's parts into a cohesive whole, and gives it its unique identity. 
Since the purpose of politics is to defend the common good of the community, it follows that the governing institutions of a society must uphold the moral order of that society. Yet in the West, mass media is what educates the masses in these norms. This state of affairs came about because the reigning ideology, liberalism, taught that the state ought to be ethically neutral. Since the formal liberal state abandoned this duty, the informal liberal state, that is to say, large corporations who can reach audiences numbering in the millions, took over this vital function. The neo-reactionary theory that we live in a press-run state makes a lot of sense in this light. Contrast this to states like Singapore or Saudi Arabia. Not only do they protect the moral order of the community, but they are also effective enough to make Disney, a foreign company whose values are hostile to theirs, kowtow to their standards. This is the very obvious fact that Hunter Avalon missed. Had these countries not put in place such strict moral guidelines, it's unlikely that Disney would have moderated themselves as they did. Even if we concede his argument that Disney is only promoting leftist messaging purely to appeal to a domestic demographic, without foreign censorship, Disney's incentive would have been to push left-wing messages as far as they can go. After all, they've made explicitly pro-sodomy works like Out before. All of this paints an uncomfortable picture that those who wish to limit the spread of left-wing messages must consider moral censorship. Granted, this is not an argument for all forms of censorship. There are going to be state leaders who censor information that's potentially embarrassing for them out of self-interest. No, I'm talking specifically here about moral censorship. Moral censorship is prohibiting materials that posit norms that go against your community's standards. For example, let's say that your community is a left-wing community that preaches tolerance and inclusivity. To maintain that environment, you'd have to prohibit certain materials that formally challenge the community's moral order. This doesn't necessitate banning scientific information or criticism of politicians. Rather, moral censorship focuses on policing the moral imperatives found implicitly or explicitly within media. Is every instance of moral censorship justified? I wouldn't say so. The moral order of a community is its soul. So if a moral order consists of harmful norms, then it is like the soul of an evil person. I'd argue that the moral order of the modern West, which is founded on post-Christian materialist progressivism, care-based ethics, and hedonism, is ultimately corrupt and in need of redemption. Still, the actions of progressives are much more explicable under this framework. Cancel culture, like other forms of moral censorship, is the flip side of positive representation. Both are essential parts of progressive moral education, which is necessary to indoctrinate the community's members into its way of life. Even liberal societies like our own require this to perpetuate themselves. Even though their views of human nature and ethics are flawed, progressives acknowledge this much. This understanding is why they are winning, after all. In light of this, Hunter Avalon's assertion that conservatives are only irrational bigots falls flat. Conservatives oppose the representation of sodomites in media because they rightfully see it as part of a larger campaign to subvert the moral order of a country. As Hunter begrudgingly admits in his video, Disney's method of representation is better than nothing from this perspective, which means that the conservatives will naturally oppose it. As I was making this video, I came across numerous examples on Twitter of left-wingers expressing confusion as to why one would protect the innocence of children. One would think that this was intuitive. Children in the formative stages of their life are more easily influenced than adults, as their mental faculties have not fully developed. This is why modern psychologists as a whole tend to look at their patient's childhood to find the source of their trauma. Why are these leftists like this? The theory of mimetic desire gives us greater insight. People on the left, having been exposed to these sexually explicit images, are now desensitized to them. Their view of reality has been warped by pornography to the point where they think that such things are normal, natural, and even healthy in an age where religiosity is widely declining. The mass media has the power to change the average person's perception of moral norms. 
As I mentioned before, leftism is self-refuting. If the left truly believed in autonomous self-expression as their rhetoric claims, they wouldn't be so obsessed with normalization. Since they are concerned with community norms, with protecting a moral order, albeit a sick, evil one, their claims to being concerned with self-expression ought to be disregarded as yet another contradiction in their worldview. This contradiction is, I believe, what led Hunter Avalon to argue that Disney was both a passive reflector of public opinion and an important influencer of public opinion. This contradictory anthropology only highlights the left's delusional and destructive nature. In the meantime, the right wing needs to recognize the ubiquity and necessity of moral censorship. This idea of freedom of expression is inherently subversive to any moral order we'll try to build. It's time we recognize it as such. Think about it this way. If we don't put in rules preventing things like this, then people will start saying things like this. And the world's getting kinder. Gen Z's gayer than grinder. Learn to love, learn to vogue, face your fate. We'll convert your children. Someone's gotta teach them not to hate. Thank you all for watching. If you liked this video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thank you, and have a nice day.